We'll be speaking about the uh, the new insolvency and bankruptcy code, uh, which has uh, become law earlier this year, and uh, is a uh, you know is uh, largely replacing the fairly varied and uh, uh, you know difficult to execute uh, you know uh, laws with regard to bankruptcy and insolvency, uh, which India was faced with till now. Uh, for the first time, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code tries to bring together uh, both corporate insolvency as well as personal or individual insolvency or bankruptcy under one umbrella. Uh, it's uh, it's path breaking in many ways, and uh, for those who uh, have been following the way uh, the the entire ease of doing business uh, argument with regard to India has been panning out, would know that one of the reasons uh, cited for why it was not easy to do business in India was the fact that it was very difficult to, uh, you know, get relief in case of, uh, particularly for creditors, in case uh, debtors were not paying up uh, uh, within the within the time frame uh, prescribed, because the litigation process was uh, e extremely long and oftentimes took over four years to complete. Uh, because of that reason, uh, it was felt that a lot of uh, private enterprise from outside of India uh, were not comfortable with doing business with Indian corporates or setting up businesses in India. Uh, what the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court tries to do is uh, put a more structured framework where uh, from having uh, debtors control the entire insolvency and bankruptcy process, they move a significant part of the control to creditors. Uh, how this is done, we will get into that, into those details uh, through this presentation. Uh, whether the insolvency and bankruptcy code will really work in the Indian scenario, keeping in mind the, the diversity of, of businesses and also keeping in mind that this same code with almost similar rules and procedures tries to also govern uh, uh, individuals, private individuals who have who've not been able to uh, pay up. And corporates and paints both sec, you know, uh, groups almost with a similar brush. Whether this will work out in the Indian scenario, we will, as as we move uh, forward, try and discuss some of that and see whether this will really work from the Indian business perspective. Uh, today, I'm joined by two of my uh, able lawyer colleagues, uh, uh, Javed and Kanishka, both of whom have been. Uh, uh, working in this area of uh, you know financial laws and bankruptcy for some time, who will be taking you through the presentation with me joining in with uh, uh, specific points from time to time. Uh, I will hand over first to Javed, who will who will start off the presentation and uh, who in turn will involve Kanishka and me from time to time. So over uh, to you, Javed, with that. Good afternoon, everyone. So, as Indrani uh, already uh, discussed or briefed us on the uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code, so I will be moving on to the slides to discuss the various aspects provided under the code, why the code was required, and the ecosystem under the code, the key aspects uh, under the code. So, moving on to the first slide, which speaks about insolvency, bankruptcy, and liquidation. These are the three terms uh, which we will uh, be discussing right now. First is insolvency. So by insolvency, we mean that it's a state of an individual or a corporate person to pay their debts when they are due and payable. By bankruptcy, it is bankruptcy. This is a uh, state when an individual is declared as incapable of paying their dues by competent court of law and by liquidation we mean that process of winding up of a corporate person that is a company the next slide speaks about the legislative framework for which deals with corporate and individual insolvency in india so as you can see that there is companies act there is uh, RDD BFI, that is the recovery of debt due from banks uh, and financial institutions. There is Surface Act, there is SICA, there is Presidency Town Insolvency Act, and Provincial Insolvency Act. 
there is LLP Act also. So these were the these are the legislative framework in India, which is presently dealing with all the insolvency regimes in India. And moving back, moving on to the next slide, which speaks about like by this slide we are trying to show the present legal framework which has been amended by virtue of this code. So as you can see, the code amends the Companies Act, it amends the Surface Act, LLP Act, SICA, by virtue of the schedules provided under the code, that is Schedule 11 amends Companies Act, Schedule 5 amends the RDD BFI Act, and two specific laws which basically deals with, dealt with, I mean, dealt with the insolvency regime regarding to the individuals who are the Presidency Town Insolvency Act and Provincial Insolvency Act 1920. Both of these acts has been repealed by the code. Uh, one more point uh, under this uh, slide which is very important, Section 238 of the code states that uh, since it is, since the code is <coughs> amending various provisions under the various acts dealing with the insolvency regime, so there is a chance of some conflict between the existing act and the new code. So to mitigate that conflict, under section 238 of the code, the code states that in case there is any in inconsistency between the existing or the present act and the present code, the provisions of the code shall prevail. Now, the next slide speaks uh, as to challenges faced during by, by the existing legal framework. So we have pointed it out as uh, the existing frameworks were highly fragmented with a legal framework with multiple judicial forums, resulting in lack of clarity and certainty in jurisdictions. Concurrent and overlapping jurisdiction encouraged <clears throat> appeals, stays, resulting in delayed decisions. Average time to resolve insolvency matters in India was is 2.4.5 uh, years compared to Singapore, which is eight months. In London, it is one year. For Australia, it is one year. So, India has the lowest recovery rate, which is the lowest debt recovery rate, that is 20 percent, and it has been confirmed by World Bank report 2014. One more. Uh, uh, one of the one more point is lack of adequate and credible data regarding the asset, assets indebtedness and security situations of the companies so these were the challenges faced by the existing legal frameworks dealing in insolvency regimes the next slide speaks about the ecosystem under the code the code aims at establishing a board which is to be called as Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. Under the board, as you can see in this slide, there are some insolvency professional agencies, information utilities, and adjudicating authorities and appellate tribunals. This insolvency professional agency will be having insolvency professionals. So essentially, uh, Javed, if I can yeah. just intervene here for a minute, what what is happening now is that we are going to have one common regulator, which is the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. Uh, we can look at it in some way as like, for example, the IRDA or the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which is going to be the single point for all insolvency related matters, both for corporates as well as in, in individuals within which, as uh, Javed was rightly pointing out, there are three aspects that we need to take into uh, consideration. And uh, obviously, as we move towards the next few slides, we will see how this whole thing pans out. But we are going to, for the first time, have a completely new concept called insolvency professionals. And as we move on, you will see how these insolvency professionals actually will be wielding extremely large amount of control and decision making when a company goes through the process of insolvency. So if if there was a, a, a petition filed uh, against a company, and we will come to that in greater detail in the coming slides, 
uh, for insolvency by one of its uh, creditors, which would be either its financial creditors or its operational creditors. Uh, once a, a particular process was followed and the accrediting authority decided that they would that there is a valid reason to uh, put the company through the process of insolvency or see if, if, if the process could be resolved, uh, they have to appoint an insolvency professional who then takes charge of the company. Uh, which essentially means that these people will obviously have to have uh, very, very uh, strong operational as well as business skills because uh, obviously uh, the, the kind of the companies that could be you know, or businesses that could be getting, you know, going through this process would be anything from a very large conglomerate to a startup. And, uh, and obviously, insolvency professionals will have to have a lot of uh, you know, business knowledge to be able to uh, work with that. Uh, information utilities, of course, is is uh, more like a, you know, for example, a civil or a credit credit rating agency. These are agencies which will uh, control or have information with regard to the credit situation of various businesses. Uh, so, for example, if a company has been defaulting on loans, has had a history of uh, you know petitions being filed by them, uh, so basically their credit rating or credit worthiness. Uh, is information which will be provided by the information utilities which can then be used uh, particularly by the financial creditors uh, in deciding whether uh, a petition for insolvency can be filed. Of course, the adjudicating authority is the critical authority which uh, for, for corporates uh, will be the NCLT and for individuals will be the uh, DRT. Uh, we will now move on to the next slide where Javed will further explain how this whole situation will work. So the next slide speaks about the scope under the act, uh, under the court. The court broadly can, the, we have broadly classified the scope under the court as one is insolvency resolution and liquidation for corporate persons and the other one is insolvency resolution and bankruptcy for individuals and partnership firms. So the first question which comes to our mind is, who can initiate a corporate insolvency resolution? So the court states that the corporate, corporate insolvency resolution can be in, initiated by a financial creditor, a operational creditor, or the corporate debtor himself. Now we need to know uh, who is a financial creditor. So the court defines a financial First, it defines the financial credit, and then it goes on to goes on defining the financial creditor. Uh, so, financial creditor means any person to whom a financial debt is owed, and includes a person to whom such debt has been legally assigned for or transferred to. A financial debt means a debt along with interest, if any, which is disbursed against the consideration of time value of money. The court also defined operational creditors and the operational debt in that case. So by the name itself we know that operational creditor means a person to whom operational debt is owed and secondly operational debt means a claim in respect of provisions of goods or services including employment or a debt in respect of repayment of dues arising under any law for the timing in force and payable to the central government or any state government or any local authority as the case may be. So essentially uh, what we can uh, basically understand from a, uh, from a you know, non-legal perspective is that financial creditors are basically banks and financial institutions people who, from whom we uh, take a formal uh, you know, credit, so it could be a working capital facility, it could be a, a loan, uh, or it could be, you know, and the loan could again be a secured loan, an unsecured loan, but a pure financial credit where the whole purpose of taking money is for running the business you know, or growing the business or taking up some new challenges, whereas operational creditors would be people like vendors. Uh, you know, people who 
uh, have to be paid either on a monthly basis or on the completion of a project. Uh, uh, operational creditors could be, for example, landlords uh, in, in case of businesses where a monthly rent has to be paid. Uh, things which are part of the day-to-day -day running of the business. And it's important to understand uh, the kind of importance both financial creditors and operational creditors are being given under this bank, uh, bankruptcy code to understand how uh, a lot of businesses, especially small and medium businesses, will have to rework their entire business uh, uh, functioning to make sure that their cash flow is significantly better than what it probably is today. Because even for uh, you know what are general business defaults, which keep happening with most businesses, uh, large and small, but particularly of concern for small businesses, uh, can lead to a bankruptcy situation where they might even lose control of their business in the short term, uh, as Javed will subsequently explain. Okay. So now, the next category of person is the corporate data. The corporate, as I as I earlier mentioned, that corporate data can also file an application with the authority for initiating the insolvency resolution provision, uh, process. So a corporate data, as it has been defined under the code, is uh, maybe a comp is the company itself or an LLP. So corporate data is actually the corporate person, and from corporate person we are deriving the definition of corporate data, which is a corp which is the company itself or the LLP. Now moving on to the next slide. Now under this slide we will uh, try to understand how the uh, what is the procedure for the entire insolvency resolution process. So. The court suggests that the court, court suggests the minimum threshold, that is the default amount, should be one lakh rupees. So to initiate an insolvency resolution process, the default has to be one lakh rupees. Then, the very the court doesn't say that uh, after the default there is a uh, there is some number of days after which you can go and file. It is not that. As soon as the default occurs. The creditor is eligible to go and apply with the application for starting an insolvency resolution process with the adjudicating authority, which However, is here. Javed, we, would, we should try and make a distinction between yeah. the uh, the two kinds of creditors that we talked about: the financial and the operational creditors. Yeah. Uh, because for financial creditors, for example, they can using the information that is available to them uh, through the new authority, the uh, agency that's been created. They can file for it next day, but with uh, with regard to operational creditors, they actually need to send a default notice, default. and and that default notice uh, has to be responded to or contested. There is an opportunity being given to the uh, to the uh, debtor, debtor to to uh, to question or challenge that, and only after that process is complete and there is a 14-day period that that is given for that. Can they file a petition with the adjudicating authority? Yeah. So, to that extent, there is a distinction made between a financial creditor and an operational creditor. Right. And, and of course, after that, once the uh, petition has been filed with the adjudicating authority, whether it is in, in one case the next day or the other after a period right. of uh, the notice uh, having been served and, and responded to, uh, the, then the process remains pretty much the same, and, and we can move on to that. Yeah. So once once the application has been filed with the authority, the Court suggests, the court, court states that the authority has to take the decision of either rejecting or approving the uh, application, and the time period for this is 14 days. Now, this is something that is interesting, and I hope uh, people who are on this uh, discussion today uh, will have some knowledge of how the uh, whole uh, judicial process in India works, especially with regard to uh, you know things like the NCLT. Uh, which is uh, extremely uh, stressed today with a large number of cases pending before it. Now this court is suddenly expected uh, with, and, and obviously once this uh, law is uh, in fully in force and, and the, risk, the various authorities have been set up, the, 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 the board has been set up, uh, we'll start seeing a lot of movement because this gives creditors a, a, a certain level of control which they did not have before. And obviously, as we can see, the threshold is extremely low. Uh, a default of one lakh can open up the door for this whole process that, that has been laid down here to be set down. Now, suddenly, if we have 
hundreds or in, in a probably over a period of time, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, such uh, uh, you know, petitions being filed with the adjudicating authority, uh, even assuming, so, so what would logically be filed as a part of this petition? There will inevitably be the original contract that has been entered into the parties, which which talks about payment terms. It could be which could be in the form of a, a proper detailed agreement, which could be in the form of a purchase order, uh, or 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 a part of a larger contract, which is at a uh, at an organizational level. Uh, and then along with that, there would be uh, you know invoices. There would be payment history. There will be bank details. Uh, there will inevitably be back and forth. Uh, emails or, or uh, physical letters which have been exchanged over non-payment, all of which will at the minimum constitute anything between 50 to 100 pages. Uh, if you take the support of lawyers like us, it might even end up being in many cases 500 or 1000 pages. Now, now if an adjudicating authority has even 50 such matters in front of them every week, uh, and if they have only two weeks to, to approve or reject the petition, they really have to be reading hundreds and thousands of pages to be able to take this decision. So uh, while obviously this law has to be lauded because you know it is it is meant to uh, improve the whole ease of doing business situation in India, uh, the the fact of the matter is that unless the the number of uh, such courts is increased dramatically or number of benches are in, uh, introduced across the country for, for filing of such petitions, it is inevitably going to choke the system very quickly and it will be extremely difficult to really get such approvals or rejections within 14 days. And if that does not happen, uh, it is not quite clear currently under the court what happens if there is no approval or rejection within 14 days. Uh, if the assumption is that the, the petition stands rejected, there is a possibility that valid bona fide claims uh, by, by creditors will, will get disregarded. Uh, if, on the other hand, the assumption is that it's approved, there can be extremely um, you know, malicious or frivolous uh, claims brought by people knowing that the adjudication authority will not really have the ability to go through the whole process of, of reading every document and approving and rejecting on merit. So this is a, a, a potentially difficult situation. Uh, which we will have to wait and see how it how it pans out. The other piece before we move into the, the the next period is the minimum threshold of one lakh. And and the fact is that the minimum threshold is one lakh, irrespective of whether it's a, a small proprietorship firm or a large global conglomerate, which probably deals in uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars. This potentially has again the risk of allowing you know frivolous claims to come in because. Uh, a one lakh rupee claim is not very high. If you know, in in you know, in many cases, uh, 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 you know, uh, a rent of uh, you know for for a large organization in itself for a for a uh, you know small space in Bombay or, or or even Bangalore or Delhi will probably run into four or five lakhs. And there could be various you know reasons why uh, rent has not been paid for a couple of months. And if that does not happen, if the landlord suddenly gets the right to start an insolvency petition, and as we will see, uh, you know, uh, get the com com uh, company out of the control of the, op uh, uh, the operational control of the existing management to uh, to the insolvency professionals, that can really run havoc in the system. And instead of uh, you know uh, exciting uh, you know for foreign companies to set up offices, that might actually uh, you know become a bigger scare. So, so whether the minimum threshold and the procedure laid down currently is appropriate is, is worth considering and looking into. Uh, Javed, why don't you tell us about the rest of it and then we can come back and yeah. discuss a little more about that. Sure. So once the petition is approved by the NCLT, which is the authority in this case, then the next step uh, will be to <clears throat> appoint the interim resolution professionals. So. As Indranil was discussing uh, some time back, that what is the importance of interim resolution provision in this case? So I would like to put some light on that as well. So this interim resolution professional, when they are appointed, they will take charge of the board. They will manage the affairs of the company, and this will be continued till the very end of the insolvency resolution process. So this is an extremely critical portion of this whole discussion because if we know how uh, you know the whole corporate debt situation was being handled 
uh, uh, through the, you know enactments like the Sarfasi Act historically, uh, we would know that the debtor continues to be fully in control uh, of the business, and oftentimes can uh, you know uh, through various uh, mechanisms like moving out money from one account to another, etc., continue to. Uh, default on payments and deceive creditors for significant periods of time, and that, of course, was was a was a major source of concern, and definitely needed needed to be corrected. But what is happening now is, you know, we're we're doing a absolute 180 degree somersault and moving to a situation where uh, the entire control is moving from uh, these corporate debtors to corporate creditors, and in many cases, probably to even creditors. Who are not necessarily the largest creditors of the company initially, and of course we'll come to how uh, you know the eventual liquidation process will require 75% of the creditors to uh, to ratify, but that 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 comes later. What happens the moment the adjudicating authority and within those 14 days decides that the matter, the petition is not frivolous per se, and therefore needs to be you know needs to be further delved into, they appoint an interim resolution professional or or an IP or an IRP, it's being called by various names. Now what happens is the moment that happens, the existing management of the organization uh, starts almost reporting into this IRP and has to follow the, so the IRP effectively becomes the CEO of the company and takes operational control of the company. And in turn, all of the existing supervisors and managers start taking instructions from the IRP. Now, while the, the spirit of the enactment is understandable, uh, the question that inevitably comes up is, does India currently have such a large set of trained professionals who will be, you know, able to? The, so obviously, the, uh, the 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 profession authority, IP authority, will have to uh, agency will have to pass all of these people and and give uh, certification to these people to be able to do this. But will who will these people be? If we are talking about uh, organizations, let's you know take uh, you know Kingfisher Airlines. Uh, if that now has to be suddenly uh, run by an IRP uh, or a small startup which is doing some you know very interesting work, say in the area of artificial intelligence or or any of that, do we have people who can operationally run such businesses for a period of 180 days and make sure that they can actually help? The purpose of that 180 days is actually to come up with a plan. Uh, with a resolution plan which will actually help the business survive. That is the purpose of the bankruptcy code. So keeping that in mind, is it is it even uh, uh, practical to expect people who are not in you know day-to-day uh, -day understanding of the business, who are not involved with the uh, of that with that particular business uh, on an ongoing basis, would it be fair to expect that these professionals will suddenly be able to walk into a business, take control, and actually instead of bringing it down? Help it survive and do better over the period of the next 180 days, so that at the end of it, there is a there's a, the, the, the the original owners can come back and take control and then run the business successfully again. At the moment, with the kind of people that are available that we can see on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, with the HR struggles that most organizations have to be able to hire even middle management uh, uh, professionals, forget about senior management professionals. This seems like an extremely far-fetched proposition at this moment. Now, uh, how this pans out, uh, where these people will come from, maybe this will open up a completely new, uh, you know, professional uh, service which will which will be great for India in the long term. But keeping in mind that you know the current situation probably does not uh, merit this, we will have to see how this whole thing pans out. So, Javed, over to you. So once. <clears throat> So, with the appointment of the interim resolution provisional, the authority will also uh, go for uh, publication, publishing the fact of initiating this uh, corporate insolvency resolution, number one. And number two is they will also call upon the creditors for claiming uh, for the dues. Once these two processes are being done, then the next step is formation of the creditors committee. So, the interim resolution provisional will form the committee of the creators. Once this committee of creators is being formed, then this committee itself will either, cont either continue with the interim resolution professional as, a, as the resolution professional or they can make an application with the authority to change the interim resolution professional and can suggest the resolution professional of their own uh, choice. Next comes 
The interesting so, point that we need to also know is yeah. that the initial interim resolution professional, so whoever is filing the original petition with the adjudicating authority, they are encouraged to suggest who they would want as the interim resolution professional. So which effectively means that any creditor uh, who is owed more than 1 lakh rupees and therefore has a bona fide claim under the bankruptcy code can not only file the petition with the adjudicating authority but can also suggest the interim resolution professional. professional. Then of course, like Javed rightly pointed out, once the, the committee of creditors, the creditors committee has been formed, they will have an opportunity to either suggest a new resolution professional uh, or continue with the existing resolution professional. But what needs to be kept in mind is by this time already almost 21 days are over. Yeah. Out of a total of 180 days, right? Javed, so yeah. there's a 180 day period of which 21 days are already gone. So if at that stage a new resolution professional comes in, it means that that person will again have to start from scratch and understand the business all over again. Right. And then only they will be able to come up with a resolution plan, which is something which has to be formulated within 180 days with the maximum yeah. of another 90 days as additional period for, yeah. within which it can be done. And at the end of that period, and if I may, Javed, just yeah. continue with the yeah. discussion. Sure. Uh, at the end of that period of 180 days or at the most 270 days, these this creditors committee will have to come up with a resolution plan, yeah. which has to be approved by more than 75% of the creditors in terms of value. So if the total credit is 100 rupees, if, 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 seven, if creditors worth 75 rupees approve a resolution plan, then that is the resolution plan which will have to be then uh, you know, approved by the adjudicating authority and implemented. Uh, if 75% of the uh, creditors cannot come up with a resolution plan, then by default, the, uh, the whole process gets into liquidation. Now, what we again need to consider here is how extremely narrow and minimal the role of the adjudication authority is. Uh, there is no real power with the adjudication authority to at this stage look at the resolution plan and even suggest any changes. So if the resolution plan uh, and, and you know if, if we, we should obviously not undermine uh, the value of creditors and uh, you know their, their intent but on the other hand it is possible by virtue of the way a business is being run and the way credit has been given especially for small and medium businesses oftentimes more than 75% of the credit would be from one individual or one bank. And if their interest militates with the interest of, say, the you know the customers of the of the business, and if they suggest a resolution plan which is not you know in, in the interest of the, the promoters, the investors, or the customers of the business, for example, even then that resolution plan has to be approved by the adjudication authority and has to then be uh, you know followed through till the end and that is that can be a source of major concern because eventually uh, as what we what we and i'm assuming that at least some of the people on this uh, in this discussion today are small and medium businesses what we need to recognize is that in many cases small and medium businesses support very large corporations and you know if the interests of those large corporations, if they, for example, if there is a, a software which has been built by a, a, a small and medium uh, or a small company or a startup uh, is being used by some of the multinational corporations uh, and then suddenly there is a resolution plan which, which, is, which is that this, this software should be sold off to a competitor, then there is an immediate potential likelihood that a whole number of businesses who have, who have been dependent on that software will get impacted directly. But in this case, there is nothing to suggest that any of them will be taken into confidence or a discussion will happen between them uh, or even with the promoters. So the promoters can attend the creditors committee meetings, for example. The directors can attend the meeting of the creditors committee. Uh, and, and, and we need to understand the creditors committee actually consists of only financial creditors. Uh, the, uh, the, the operational creditors will be invited to the meetings of these creditors committee but will not have a vote. Similarly, the directors and the promoters of the company will not have a vote but can attend the creditors committee meeting. So essentially this is a financial creditors committee who oftentimes have nothing but their professional or, or, or financial interests in mind and they will be take, you know, taking a decision with regard to the resolution plan. And this resolution plan, the adjudicating authority has no, no, no right to question and ask for amendments. 
if they agree to it, if, if, if it is passed by 75%, they'll have to agree with it. If they don't, then they will have to push that company towards liquidation. Again, the intent is obviously uh, you know, proper and there is no doubt that this, this is uh, in the, a step in the right direction. But whether this is the right step itself does require some more deliberation, keeping the Indian situation in mind. In this context, I would want to specifically talk about the small and medium businesses again. Uh, the way, you know, for example, today a small business works with many, uh, on many cases works with large entities. Now, if a large entity defaults on their payment for no, no valid reason, it is extremely unlikely that a small business uh, who's a vendor in that case will really be uh, filing a petition because they would be worried about winning any further business from the client. Uh, similarly, uh, a small business would be extremely uh, worried about uh, not being able to pay because if they're they're stuck right in the middle where they can't when a situation arises actually sue a, a, a large company which is in their case a debtor on the other hand with even with their smallest of vendors because they have they're a startup because they've just started they do not have the uh, the ability to uh, wield any kind of control over the over a system where a, a, a landlord or a small vendor who they owe 1.5 lakh rupees starts a bankruptcy proceeding under this uh, under this case uh, under this code. Similarly, you know, all of us who have gone through the startup and the and the early stage cycle know how often the cash flow situation in the organization gets to a point where it difficult it becomes difficult to pay salaries on time. Now, uh, so any any default in the payment of salary can you know lead to a situation where the, the, the bankruptcy code comes into play and the biggest worry with that is if it was only about you know then going through the resolution process that would have been fine but here the biggest worry is that the company's control goes off to a bunch of people who might not necessarily have the right amount of knowledge to be able to run the company and that can potentially lead to those companies actually collapsing during that 180 day period uh, instead of really being able to uh, wake up and do better in the, in, the, in the coming years. So if the purpose from a startup perspective is to help with a quick dissolution of their existing business so that they can get on with life and move forward, then the bankruptcy code would work very well. But if the purpose is to help those startups get up and, and run again, then it is it is questionable how much this existing process is going to help with this regard. Uh, uh, sorry, Javed, for interjecting. You can please carry on. <clears throat> so the next slide, as you can see, it speaks about the fast track corporate insolvency. This is one more aspect of the corporate insolvency resolution uh, process. Under this process, uh, the difference between the normal corporate insolvency process and the first track process is this insolvency process will be applicable in case of a corporate data which is yet like which has to be notified by the central government depending upon its asset and income class of creditors and the amount of the debt actually a set of corporate data for a set of corporate data this first track insolvency process will be applicable and the entire like as in as, as in the previous case the entire time period to for the insolvency resolution uh, to complete the insolvency resolution was 180 days in this case it is only a period of 90 days the the process remains same like like there, is, there will be an application to the authority there will be uh, appointment of resolution professionals everything will be same but the the definition of the corporate data will be restricted to what has been what will be defined by the central government in this case and the number of days should be reduced to 90 days this 90 day again can be extended to a further 90 days subject to approval of the creditors committee with a 75 percent majority voting as well as uh, uh, this is it and and going and going forward i think uh, konishko will be uh, Konishko will be taking on the liquidation procedures and uh, what, what more key, key aspects and the conclusion. So Konishko, if you can. Thank you very much, Javed. 
and uh, of course, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are looking into the slide which says grounds for liquidation for cor for a corporate person. So we were talking about liquidation, and uh, of course, after the entire process of insolvency resolution, um, you know, these are the key four steps because of which a company may go into liquidation. So the first step it says a 75% majority of creditors committee does not approve of the resolution plan. So there is a resolution plan that is the purpose of the insolvency procedures. Now, if the plan or the resolution plan is not approved by 75% of the majority of the creditors, it would directly go into liquidation. The company would directly go into liquidation. Now, the second point, of course, says that the NCLT rejects the resolution plans submitted to it on technical grounds. So here, the adjudicating authority has a little bit of power where it can go ahead and reject the resolution plan completely and you know, force the company into liquidation directly. But we need to clarify that this is only for technical reasons. They cannot look at the substantive issues uh, for the formation or, uh, or, or, or creation of a resolution plan. It is only on technical reasons that, can, that a resolution plan can be uh, rejected by the NCLT, which would effectively mean that they will have to come back with the technicalities have been, uh, having been taken care of, uh, which, which is what uh, uh, I was talking about when I said that the adjudicating authorities' uh, powers are significantly uh, reduced. Absolutely. That is correct. So uh, moving to the third point, it says, like, in case if there is a resolution plan in place and it is binding among the, the debtors as well as the creditors. And in these situations, if a debtor contravenes to the agreed resolution plan and you know a person is affected, a creditor is affected, that creditor can go ahead and make an application to the NCLT, the educating authority, and liquidate the debtor's company right away. So that again, you know, gets liquidation into the cards. And of course the third the fourth point is also you know, based on the creditor's decision, if the creditors are unable to approve a resolution plan within the scheduled 180 days, which may be extended up to, you know, for 90 days more, then again, the company will go into liquidation directly. So uh, moving on to the next slide, you know, we will look into the way the priority of payment of claims under liquidation has been uh, described under this code. So we had a priority of payment, you know, with the erstwhile legislature that we had. However, it changes with this court, it changes a little. So if you look into the order of the priority of distribution of assets, um, we see that top of the list would be insolvency related cost, which should be paid for first. Then it would be the secured creditors and the workmen dues up to 24 months. Third on the list would be other employee salaries, which may be due up to 12 months. Fourth would be financial debts for unsecured creditors. Fifth is government dues up to two years. And uh, you know, following it would be remaining debts and dues and equity. So this is again uh, you know, a significant change from where things stood today. So the one thing that is happening is the first set of people, of course, are the insolvency costs, them, uh, uh, the costs with regard to this insolvency. But the next thing that is happening is Secured creditors now stand pari passu with workmen. Uh, so for the first time, uh, workmen as opposed to employees, so workmen would be more people uh, who are working in uh, shop floors and, and uh, people who are working in factories. Uh, uh, and as defined, we would assume under the Industrial Disputes Act, uh, would be now treated at par with secured creditors. And their dues will have up to 24 months, will have to be paid uh, in the in the hierarchy before and the next set of people who go into it are employees salaries uh, and dues up to 12 months so first workmen secure creditors and workmen at uh, you know Paripasu, then employee salaries the other piece that is interesting and which might, we might not have specifically covered in this presentation is that any money that needs to be paid and therefore kept aside for gratuity for provident fund is actually outside of the total quantum of you know the, the of debt which which is considered as a part of the corporate debtors uh, payable amount so that is set aside and will not be put as a part of this hierarchy 
that will have to be separately paid to people to whom the gratuity or the profit and bond is due, which again shows that the, the intent of the legislature is to make sure that employees, workmen are given priority over various other uh, you know, people, including, and what is interesting is government dues. So we see secure creditors as the first set of people along with workmen, followed by employees, followed by financial debts, which would again mean, say, unsecured loans that the, that the business has, followed by government dues. And then we come to any remaining debts and dues, which really puts uh, people like, you know, landlords, people like vendors, way below in the list as compared to, say, you know, the government or employees or financial debts, and might lead to uh, a lot of, you know, suppliers, vendors, having more worries about doing business with companies whose cash flow situation is not complete because they know that even if they are the ones who are raising the, the or starting the bankruptcy petition, they might not be the people who will be getting the benefits of that and in the hierarchy they would be fairly low down and might really not be able to get a lot of the money that is owed to them. Of course, logically equity is right at the bottom and that's that's probably uh, uh, you know uh, just about right. Uh, we can move on. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next slide, and probably this is um, you know a very important slide. Let's talk about voluntary liquidation. So, in spite of the code, you know, uh, which specifically you know talks about insolvency and bankruptcy, it also you know gets voluntary liquidation a part of its ambit. So, in cases of voluntary liquidation, or where the company in itself decides that you know they want to go ahead and dissolve or they want to get liquidated. There are steps in inside this ambit of this you know, code so that you know they can follow it and go ahead and get voluntarily liquidated. So uh, the steps are that the first at first the company has to declare in form of an affidavit that it has no debts and is able to pay its existing debts and it has no purpose to defraud anybody in you know uh, with this particular liquidation in attachment to this particular uh, declaration they have to attach um, audited financial statements record of, of business operation for the last two years a report of valuation of assets as well now after this is done after the declaration uh, within four weeks the company has to um, you know in a general general meeting has to pass a special resolution the resolution should be about liquidating the company and to appoint our insolvency resolution professional as a liquidator now in case there are creditors for this particular company who's voluntarily uh, liquidating itself uh, the creditors has to approve of this special resolution within seven days after the special resolution has been declared. Now, after all of these steps, the company also has to notify the uh, registrar of the company and also the board within seven days of the resolution or the approval of the creditors. Post which the liquidation process starts, again following the you know, liquidation process as per the code. After the liquidation is complete, the liquidator may make an application to the adjudicating authority. Again, it will be uh, the National um, Company Law Tribunal out here uh, to pass dissolution order on the completion of the liquidation. And the adjudicating authority will pass an order of dissolution. This order would again be placed to the concerned authority with which the corporate debtor is registered within 14 days. So again, a time-bound way of dealing with voluntary liquidation as well. But the entire steps is again defined under this particular code. Now I'll move on to the next slide, and this um, talks about the insolvency resolution and bankruptcy for individual and partnership firms. What is interesting about this part of this code is that the minimum default amount is rupees one thousand. So a minimum of one thousand can get a person, an individual, or a person partnership firm you know, in, into the ambit of this code. Now, the code has, this part of the code, it deals with three main processes of insolvency. The first is the automatic fresh start. Second is insolvency resolution process, which is pretty much similar to uh, the way it 
happen for the company. And the third is bankruptcy, uh, like liquidation for a company, we have bankruptcy for individuals and partnership firms. Now, if we, and of course, the adjudicating authority in these situations is the debt recovery tribunal or the DRT. And again, we need to uh, quickly stop here for a minute and just consider the situation. So anybody with over uh, 1,000 rupees uh, debt, uh, in fact, if, if anybody owes you more than 1,000 rupees, uh, and if there is uh, after a, uh, you know, again, you have to give a sub in the notice, of course, but if, if they probably, you know, in, in the Indian scenario, oftentimes uh, we know how notices don't even reach people. Uh, at the end of it, you can actually go ahead and start a, uh, you know, the a, a put, put the person through the process of bankruptcy. And again, where you have to file is uh, the debt recovery tribunal. Uh, since we are talking about uh, CII and we're talking about small and medium businesses, there are many small businesses which are operating from you know, remote parts of the country. There are uh, food processing units, there are agricultural units across the country. Uh, as we know, debt recovery tribunals only are present in the, the state capitals. So to expect somebody who owes someone maybe 3,000 rupees and therefore has been pulled into a bankruptcy petition to come from remote parts of the state to the state capital to appear before a debt recovery tribunal uh, seems again to be uh, not in the spirit of uh, ease of doing business. Uh, it is it is unlikely that it's going to uh, you know serve any any material purpose. Whether one thousand rupees in two thousand sixteen is a valid amount is a valid default amount for a uh, for a individual or whether one lakh rupees is a valid default default amount for a business uh, is something that probably requires some more uh, discussion and deliberation. Uh, back to you, Kanishka. Thank you so much. So if you look at the next slide, we'll understand what fresh start for individual means. Out here, fresh start is, um, you know, for an eligible debtor under this particular fresh start process, uh, eligible debtor who is unable to pay his debt shall be entitled to make an application, either personally or through a resolution professional, for a fresh start resulting in discharge of his qualified debts. So this is a good thing. However, it has a lot of qualifications. So if you look into uh, the eligibility criteria for eligible debtor, we'll find that the gross, the gross annual income does not exceed 60,000. So for an eligible debtor to you know, apply for a fresh start, the gross annual income should not exceed 60,000. The aggregate value of assets does not exceed 20,000 rupees. The aggregate value of qualifying debts does not exceed 35,000 rupees. The debtor should not be an undischarged bankrupt. The debtor does not own a dwelling unit. A fresh start process, insolvency process, or a bankruptcy process is not subsisting. Or, and, I'm sorry, uh, no previous fresh start order has been made in, you know, for, uh, in the last 12 months in, in, in regards to this particular person who is applying for a fresh start process. Now, other than that, there is information in regards to what is a qualified debt. The code describes it. The code says that the qualified debt can be any debt. However, there it cannot be excluded debts, it cannot be debts which are secured, and it cannot be debts which are incurred in the last three months from the date of the application. Now, what are excluded debts? Excluded debts can be fines and fine imposed by a court or a tribunal. It can be damages for negligence, nuisance, breach of a statutory or contractual or other legal obligation. It can be maintenance of any person. It can be student loan. So these, these debts will not be a part of qualified debts for an um, eligible debtor. So a person, these debts would not be considered at all. Now, fresh start, of course, it um, is only uh, available for individual insolvency. So only an individual uh, can apply for a fresh start. And the resolution professional appointed by a debt recovery tribunal shall examine uh, the merits of a fresh start application and shall submit a report to the DRT for its decision. Now, out here again, we see that you know the resolution professional would have more uh, authority uh, you know, as we were discussing, a uh, more authority than even the educating authority or the tribunal would have. 
Now, moving on to the next slide, this um, talks about individual insolvency resolution, the process. The process is pretty much similar to uh, the one that we discussed uh, for corporates. It's more or less absolutely the same. Uh, however, we'll quickly um, you know, read the uh, main points that we have here. So an application to initiate an insolvency resolution process shall uh, be made by the debtor himself or the creditors through the insolvency resolution professional with the debt recovery tribunal or the DRT. Uh, now the partners, it, it also applies for partnership firms. So the partners of a partnership firm shall not be allowed to apply for an insolvency resolution process unless a joint application is filed by the majority of the partners of a yeah. partnership firm. So yes, so we require a majority of the partners for a partnership firm to go, in, uh, go into an individual um, so, so just to clarify, since we are talking about this, uh, it is not just individuals. Uh, uh, the Debt Recovery Tribunal is the forum for partnership firms as well. So all the you know uh, law firms in this country, all the chartered accountancy firms in this country, uh, many businesses uh, which are run in the form of partnership, uh, as opposed to LLP, which is covered by the NCLT along with companies, uh, but. Uh, a lot of you know partnership firms and individuals and proprietorship businesses will get covered by the DRT, and therefore uh, even this mechanism has a significant you know has significance for businesses and not just for individual uh, debtors. Uh, you know, and we can carry on. Thank you. Uh, the creditors and the debtors shall have to arrive at an agreement as uh, to the repayment plan. Uh, which shall be approved by 75% of the financial creditors. Pretty much similar uh, to what we had discussed for the corporate uh, credit, corporate uh, persons as well. Uh, once the plan is finalized, it will be placed to the DRT to, to, to be finalized and pass in order accordingly. Once approved, it becomes binding to the party. So, of course, uh, once a resolution plan is finalized, it will be binding. And like the corporate proceedings, if it does not, if it is not approved by 75% of the financial creditors, it would directly go into bankruptcy. Now, moving on to the next slide, this uh, you know talks about the bankruptcy of individuals or partnership firms. Um, the bankruptcy of individuals and partnership firms can only uh, take place or only be initiated after the failure of the insolvency resolution process. And the bankruptcy trustee, so once the bankruptcy procedure starts, the person who is the insolvency resolution professional may become the bankruptcy trustee as well. And uh, the bankruptcy trustee shall be responsible for the administration of the estate of the bankrupt and shall pay the claims based on the priority defined under this code. So, the so essentially what's happening is that under the, uh, uh, in, in the case of corporates, uh, the insolvency professional uh, typically is also expected to become the official liquidator once the liquidation process starts. Similarly, with regard to individuals or partnership firms, uh, if the insolvency profession, if the matter goes into bankruptcy, the insolvency professional is meant to be the bankruptcy trustee. You know, that, that's the uh, you know the typical situation that is envisaged, and and they are the ones who are uh, then supposed to uh, you know administer the estate and and complete the uh, the plan laid down by the resolution process. We are aware that we are, we, are, we are kind of running short of time, so the interest of uh, time we will, uh, we will stop here uh, because there are many issues that we can, we can keep discussing and, and then there's of course the whole concept of cross-border bankruptcy uh, and insolvency which we haven't even had the opportunity of, uh, uh, of, of touching uh, on here. Uh, that is an area which we believe will also uh, require some more uh, scrutiny by, by the uh, by the government as well as the legislators because again that kind of envisage is uh, a situation where India keeps uh, uh, entering into bilateral contracts uh, with uh, various uh, various countries for uh, them to be uh, you know brought into the purview of uh, the bankruptcy code uh, whereas there are model ancestral laws which are available which have been signed by most countries you know at least most uh, uh, countries like the US and uh, European uh, Union uh, you know countries uh, which allows for a, a, a easier forum through which we can administer the bankruptcy code but that's for another day we are we are, we are aware of the fact that we had time till four o'clock and we are already uh, 
three three minutes past the time. So, uh, Mr. Rao, we will stop here, and we will uh, very happily take any questions that the uh, the, the audience might have, and, and probably will have an opportunity of of responding to them and, and, and being able to take you through some of the issues that we could not cover because of the paucity of time.